It'll take just a minute to define the symbols, starting with position X. Here is the X axis. X represents the location of the object along the X axis. X represents how far you have traveled from the origin. Distance X is measured in meters. Velocity V is measured in meters per second and represents how quickly your location is changing. We have velocity equals delta X over delta T. Delta always means a change, which is final minus initial values. So our velocity is a final minus initial location divided by a final minus an initial time. The notation's a little simpler if we choose to represent the final location as x and the initial location as x sub zero. When we choose to start our clock at t equals zero when the motion begins, then our initial time is always zero. t sub final minus t sub initial, the duration of an event, is represented by t. If your location is not changing, then your velocity is zero. Acceleration A is the measure of how quickly velocity is changing, or how quickly you get fast. It is measured in meters per second per second. Acceleration A equals delta V over delta T equals V sub final minus V initial divided by T sub final minus T initial. And again, the notation is simpler if we use symbol V to represent final velocity. V sub zero represents initial velocity. The duration T of an event is T sub final minus T sub initial. Moving at constant acceleration means that your velocity increases by a constant amount per unit of time. If your velocity is constant, then your acceleration is zero. Motion with constant acceleration is described by these three equations. The first equation, final location x equals initial location x sub zero plus initial velocity v zero multiplied by time plus one half the acceleration a multiplied by time squared. The final velocity v equals initial velocity v sub zero plus acceleration a multiplied by time t. If you take time t from the second equation and put it into the first equation, then you get the third equation. A final velocity squared equals an initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration a times final location x minus initial location x sub zero. This looks like three equations, but it's really only two because the third was a rearrangement of the first two. There are six letters that appear in these equations. If we have only two equations, then we can have only two unknowns. You are always given four out of six of these letters in any homework problem. We solve a problem by drawing a picture, including the axis. Then we identify the four out of six given letters. And then we look in the equations to see which one is usable because it contains a single unknown. Write the equation first in symbols and then substitute in the numbers. Calculate the final result and decide if it makes sense. Draw a box around the final result. Include units. Breaking a homework problem into these few steps always gets to the solution. If we don't do these steps, then it means you're trying to solve the entire problem in your head all at once. I'm never successful at that. You should consider your homework solution to be notes that you write to yourself to read the night before the test. You'll be grateful to yourself for having written out a sentence in words explaining how you went about solving the problem. If your homework solution looks like this, it will be of no help to you in studying the night before the test. Yet another rearrangement gives the equation final location x equals initial location x sub zero plus the average velocity multiplied by time t. 
where the average velocity is initial plus final divided by 2. While crossing a 3 meter wide bridge, a person's velocity goes from 0 0.3 meters per second to 2.2 meters per second. What is the acceleration? How many seconds elapsed while crossing the bridge? First, we draw a picture and include the x-axis. We'll put the origin at the location where the described motion begins. From the statement of the question, we will know four out of these six quantities. We started the motion at x sub zero equals zero. The bridge is three meters wide, so the final location x equals three meters. The initial velocity was 0 0.3 meters per second, and the final velocity is 2.2 .2 meters per second. These are the four out of six known values. We don't know the acceleration a or the time t. Next, we look at our three main equations to find one that contains a single unknown. The first equation cannot be used at this moment because we don't know a and we don't know t. The second equation cannot be used at this moment because we don't know a or t. We can use the third equation because we know everything except a. Solving this equation for a gives a equals v squared minus v zero squared divided by two times x minus x sub zero, which is written in algebraic symbols first. Next, we substitute numbers for each symbol and the calculation gives 0.8 meters per second squared. This is a reasonable number. An acceleration of 500 meters per second squared or of 1 500th meters per second squared would not be a reasonable number. A car traveled 11 meters in 1.2 seconds while its velocity increased by 0 0.54 meters per second in each second. What was its initial velocity and what was its final velocity? We first make a picture and choose to put our origin where the described motion begins to occur. The given information will tell us four out of six of these variables. First, Constant acceleration means that the velocity increases by a constant amount with each passing second. Here we were told that that constant acceleration is 0 0.54 meters per second per second. We chose the initial value x sub 0 equals 0. The final value x equals 11 meters. And the elapsed time is 1.2 seconds. We know four out of these six variables. We don't know the initial or the final velocities. Next, we look for an equation that contains a single unknown. In the first equation, we know everything except the initial velocity v sub zero. Solving for v sub zero, we get x minus x sub zero minus one half a t squared divided by t. We fill in the numbers and the calculator gives 8.8 .8 meters per second. Now that we know the initial velocity, v sub zero, we use the equation v equals v zero plus a t to get the final velocity. Putting in the numbers gives 9.5 meters per second for the final velocity. This is a reasonable number because it's higher than the previous velocity but it's not too high. In every problem, we're always given four out of the six variables. Making this list makes each problem easier to do. This intersection has a width of 15 meters. What is the acceleration of the car as it takes four seconds to travel across that intersection? We know four out of six of the variables 
and use the first equation to get an acceleration of 1.9 meters per second squared. For the rest of your life, you can use this approach to calculate the acceleration of your favorite vehicle. If you drop a rock, what sort of motion results? We can tell that the falling rock speeds up, but how does its acceleration change? We've all seen this every day, but never had any reason to get out rulers and stopwatches to measure this motion. Around the year 1600, Galileo did, and he discovered acceleration, and that the dropped object falls with the constant acceleration of g equal 9.8 meters per second squared. Before this, nobody knew that nature makes use of acceleration. Before Galileo, people might speak of fast or slow, stopped or moving, but nobody ever thought of a change in speed. Some 40 years later, Isaac Newton discovered that force causes acceleration. Isaac Newton will be the hero of our next chapter. Would you expect that objects fall with constant acceleration? Or would you expect their acceleration to change as they fail? We find out by making repeatable measurements of nature, and nature always surprises us. An object has been dropped from rest. These are the measurements of its position and speed through the first four seconds of its fall. This column is the time. At t equals zero, the speed is zero meters per second. One second later, the speed is 9.8 meters per second, and then 19.6, 29.4, and 39.2 meters per second. We see that the speed has changed by 9.8 meters per second, between each successive second. The speed is changing linearly in time. We have V equals V0 plus GT, since the acceleration is equal to G. This column has the total distance fallen. This distance is changing quadratically in time. So when dropped from rest at the origin, the distance fallen is given by Y equals 1 half GT squared. The change in speed from second to second is constant, but the change in distance is growing quadratically in time. An object is dropped from rest at height h. What is the velocity of the object at the instant just before it hits the ground? Drop from rest means that the initial velocity v sub zero equals zero. Here's the object at height h. We choose to put the plus y axis upward, minus y downward. The acceleration of this block is downward, so we assign a negative value to the acceleration. We write a equals minus g equals minus 9.8 meters per second squared. The value g is always positive 9.8 meters per second squared. The acceleration sometimes is plus g and sometimes is minus g, depending on your choice of coordinate system. What is the velocity of the object at the instant before it hits the ground? In the equation, v squared equals v0 squared plus 2ay minus y0, we set the initial velocity v sub 0 equals 0, since we are dropped from rest. We set the acceleration equal minus g. The final y position is zero at the ground, and the initial y position, y sub zero equals h. Then we have v squared equals minus 2g times minus h, which makes 2gh. When we take the square root, we have to say plus or minus. We have v equals plus or minus the square root of 2gh. And we'll choose to use the negative root because the final velocity is pointing in our negative y direction. So we have v equals minus the square root of 2gh. Let's do the same problem again but choose to have the positive y direction downward and the negative y axis upward. The acceleration of this block is still downward but this time that's in our positive y direction. So we write a equals plus g 
equals plus 9.8 meters per second squared. We use the same equation, but this time a equals plus g. Then our equation becomes v squared equals 2gh. When we take the square root, we still have to say plus or minus, but this time we choose to take the positive root. The final velocity is plus square root of 2gh. Everyone agrees that the direction of the velocity and the direction of the acceleration is toward the ground in this case. It is okay that half of us say that downward is the positive direction and half of us say that downward is the negative direction. Riding along a couple thousand meters of this test track, this sled is used to test human acceleration. This person, John Stapp, sets in the chair that's bolted to the sled. And then this rocket engine in the back is ignited. In five seconds, the car is going 632 miles per hour. And then a system of water brakes stops the cart in 1.4 seconds. What is John's acceleration? We put the origin where the car begins to slow, so x sub 0 equals 0. We don't know the final x. The final velocity is 0. We convert the initial velocity to meters per second by dividing by 2.25. We get 281 meters per second. The stopping time was 1.4 seconds, and we don't know the acceleration. We use v equals v0 plus at to find that the acceleration is 200 meters per second squared, which is 20 g. This means that John Stapp felt 20 times heavier while stopping. That's equivalent to having 20 persons set in your lap. To read this, please press pause. How did Stapp describe his decelerating experience? In a car crash, the velocity is one-tenth as great, but the duration is also one-tenth as long, resulting in the same acceleration of about 20 g, which John Stapp showed that the human body can withstand. When seat belts are used, then the deceleration of the car passengers is about 20 g during a collision. If passengers are not wearing a seat belt, the car stops, but the people keep moving. A short time later, the passengers collide with the dashboard and windshield, and then the acceleration is more like 40 g, which breaks bones and such. Throughout the world each year, about 1 million people die in car crashes, including 40,000 persons in the U.S. Professional race cars are better equipped, so injuries are far less likely even though race cars travel at double or triple the highway speed. Jerry the giraffe runs at constant velocity past his stationary friend, Tammy the T-Rex, who has constant acceleration for a few seconds and then runs at constant speed until catching Jerry. Plot graphs of the motion and determine when and where they will meet. Here is the plot of acceleration versus time. The T-Rex starts from rest and accelerates for 20 seconds and then moves at constant velocity, which means zero acceleration. The giraffe has zero acceleration throughout the motion. Here is a plot of velocity versus time. The T-Rex starts from rest and accelerates until reaching this velocity after running for 20 seconds and then the T-Rex runs at constant speed. The giraffe runs at this lower constant speed throughout the time. Here's a plot of position versus time. The giraffe runs at constant speed so its location grows linearly in time as x equals v sub g t. 
During the first 20 second interval, the T-Rex is accelerating and the plot of x of t is this parabola, 1 half at squared. After running for 20 seconds, then the T-Rex runs at constant speed. The speed of the T-Rex is greater than the speed of the giraffe, so the slope of this T-Rex line is greater than the slope of this giraffe line. The two creatures meet where these lines intersect because they are then at the same position x at the same moment in time t. To calculate the meeting place, we first convert the given speeds from kilometers per hour to meters per second. There are 1,000 meters in one kilometer, and one hour has 3,600 seconds. This means that we divide kilometers per hour by 3.6 to get meters per second. The velocity of the giraffe is 50 over 3.6 makes 13.9 meters per second, and the velocity of the T-Rex is 60 over 3.6 makes 16.7 meters per second. We get the acceleration of the T-Rex from the equation V equals V0 plus AT, where V0 equals 0. We have A equals V over T equals 0 0.835 meters per second squared. Both creatures meet at the same x location at the same moment in time. Equating locations, we have the position x for the T-Rex equals the position x for the giraffe, or the velocity of the giraffe multiplied by time t2, which is the total time, equals one-half the acceleration of the T-Rex multiplied by t1 squared, where t1 is equal to 20 seconds which is the time through which the T-Rex was accelerating. The next term here represents the amount of time that the T-Rex was running at constant velocity, which is the total amount of time minus the 20-second interval of acceleration. Solving this equation for T2, we get 60 seconds, and then either side of this previous equation gives the distance at 830 meters when the two creatures meet. By the way, we human beings are one of the few mammals on the planet who can run for long distances. We'll write energy equations for this in an upcoming chapter. Running warms us, so we have less body hair than other mammals. This hair loss occurred 3 million years ago. You are holding a coin while riding in a car that is traveling at 20 meters per second or 45 miles per hour. The car, you, and the coin are each traveling horizontally at 20 meters per second. If you let go of the coin, then the car, you, and the coin are all still traveling at 20 meters per second, but the coin falls straight down to the floor of the car while a coin continues moving forward at 20 meters per second. The coin doesn't hit the floor behind you. It lands directly beneath its release point. Now instead, you are holding a coin in your hand while riding in a helicopter that is moving vertically upward at 20 meters per second. The helicopter, you, and the coin are each traveling vertically at 20 meters per second. Next, you hold the coin outside the window and let go. At the instant that you let go of the coin, the coin still has an upward velocity of 20 meters per second. When released, the velocity of the coin does not suddenly become zero, even though we might mistakenly assume that it is zero. If the helicopter is 100 meters above the ground when you let go of the coin, what will be the coin's velocity just before it hits the ground? How many seconds does it take for the coin to hit the ground? Let's put y equals zero at the ground level with the positive y-axis upward. Then the downward acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. The initial height, y zero, equals 100 meters. And the initial velocity is 20 meters per second. The final velocity, we don't know. The final height is zero meters. And we don't know the time t. 
we look for a usable equation. We can use the last equation, which contains v squared. When we take the square root, we have to again use plus or minus, and we'll choose the negative root because we know that the final velocity is in the downward direction. We get minus 49 meters per second. Now that we know the final velocity, we use the short equation to find the time, and we get 7 seconds. Here are the plots of the position, velocity, and acceleration of the coin as it first rises and then falls to the ground. The acceleration throughout the motion is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. When the coin is released, its initial velocity is upward and positive. The velocity of the coin shrinks to zero and then becomes increasingly negative. The coin is released at this height above the ground. It continues moving upward until its velocity becomes zero. Then it reverses direction and falls back toward the ground. Rock A is dropped from a building of height H. Rock B is thrown upward from the ground. The two rocks meet when V sub A equals minus 2V sub B. At what fraction of the building height do the two meet? Let's choose to put Y equals 0 at the ground and positive Y upward. Then the downward acceleration is A equal minus G. Let's fill in a table of the initial heights and velocities for the two rocks. Rock A was dropped from height H with a velocity of 0. Rock B was thrown upward at Y equals 0 with an initial upward velocity of V sub 0 B. Let's write the Y and the velocity equations for each of the two rocks. The equation Y equals Y0 plus V0 T plus 1 half A T squared. For rock A, this is y sub A equals h minus 1 half gt squared. For rock B, that's y equals v0b times t minus 1 half gt squared. The equation v equals v0 plus at becomes v sub A equals minus gt. For rock A, and for rock B, we have v sub B equals v0b minus gt. The two rocks meet when they are both at the same position y. We have y sub a equals y sub b or h minus 1 half gt squared equals v sub 0 b times t minus 1 half gt squared. The t squared terms cancel and we're left with h equals v sub 0 b t. Relating velocities, we have v sub a is minus 2 v sub b or minus gt equals minus 2 times v sub 0 b minus gt, or minus gt equals minus 2 v sub 0 b plus 2 gt, which gives t equals 2 v 0 b divided by 3 g, so that the previous result, h equals v sub 0 b times t, becomes h equals 2v sub 0b squared divided by 3g. This makes y sub a equal h minus 1 half gt squared become y sub a equals 2v 0b squared divided by 3g minus 1 half g times 2v sub 0b over 3g all squared. This equals 4 ninth times v sub 0 b squared over g, which is the same thing as 2 thirds h. This means that the rocks meet at the location y equals 2 thirds h. Can you determine the speed of this motorcycle driver in Bogota, Colombia?